Okay, so we are live, and uh, I t oh, Laura's here. Hi, Laura. How are you? Um, this is going to be a little awkward because I've never done this kind of setup before. So basically, I'm looking at a television screen, uh, and I can see your comments from a bit of a distance. Uh, I have to squint a little bit. Hi, Chris. Hi, Virginia. I'm really surprised. I didn't think a lot of you would be joining me today. Um, I, I just thought I'd try this because... Um, Walter and I have not been in self-isolation because we don't have the virus or anything like that right now. Um, Walter does have a sniffle. He's got a cold. He's still in bed upstairs because it is, it's only 9.20 in, in, in the morning, our time. And um, so I think I need to get out my phone for this because I can't really read your comments from the distance I'm sitting from my screen. Just give me a second here. Uh, let me see. What do I need to get into? There we go. And, and that's a little better, but I gotta turn off the volume. That's a little better. Okay, so let me get started on this. Uh, Laura's working from home today, and well, we are all staying home. Yep, and I thought, you know, we might go stir crazy pretty fast here. So um, we need, you know, a little fun. And uh, what I usually do most of the time, as you know, is I'm sewing. So I thought I'd invite you into my sewing room and I will sew along. Um, or you can craft along or you can watch, you can chat, whatever you've got time to do or want to do. And we'll see how this works out. Um, Chris says, I got my resin today and was looking at some resin videos on YouTube when I saw your live notification. It is evening here. Yep, it is. And Laura says, Ford just declared a state of emergency. Ontario I ain't going nowhere. Yep, I know. Uh, kind of difficult, but uh, like I said, Walter has a sniffle. He's got a cold. We've been monitoring our temperatures, but it's just a cold. And um, I have not been out since Thursday. Um, we're well stocked up with things. Toilet paper. Yeah, we were already stocked up on that. We didn't go out and, and make a special trip for any of that. Um, so we're, we're fine. But, you know, you get a little cabin fever after a while, too. So... I thought maybe this would be a way at least to relieve, alleviate some of my cabin fever. Um, thanks, Chris. It's actually, I have tried to do lives from my sewing room before, and my sewing room is really my sewing dungeon, okay? Uh, this room is, uh, half of it is Walter's workshop. The other half is my sewing room. And uh, you can't see it in this shot, but just over here, there is a treadmill, which folds up against the wall and I take it down every morning when I need it. It's cramped. It would be nice to have a real legit sewing room, which I'm thinking about. Um, I may have mentioned this before, but my craft room, as you all know, where I do my vlogs from, uh, that room uh, sadly needs to be updated. Uh, and I'm thinking that a lot of my craft stuff I may be getting rid of down the road, not tomorrow, not next week. I don't know when this is going to happen. Um, and I'm going to redo the whole room. We're going to strip it right down to the walls, rip up the flooring, redo the flooring, redo counter spaces and things like that. Because basically we put that room in 25 years ago. Um, it's gone through many changes over the 25 years, but now I want to make it more into a combination sewing craft room kind of a thing. And I have to sit down and plan it out and think about it and probably need about $5,000 to do it. On top of it all. So that's one reason why it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, so for now, my sewing room is this unfinished part of the basement uh, that has a workshop over one corner. I'm not going to show you pictures of that because, yeah, it's a mess. It's Walter's half and it looks like a hoarder uh, spot. And my half is much neater, but I have a lot of equipment in here. Okay, as you can see, behind me is one sewing machine. That's my travel machine, and this is my big mother that I do my embroidery on and everything else. Um, so I'll show you what I'm working on today. Just grab it here. I have a table set off to the side so I can uh, don't have to get up where my camera is and everything too often. But this is what I'm working on. It's called Doves of Hope. It's a large block when you get it done, a lot of half square triangles. I have about four of these large blocks done. I think I need about 12, not sure. So that's what I'm gonna work on today. And uh, yeah, I haven't worked on it for a while, so I had to kind of review my uh, instructions here. 
to see what I'm supposed to be doing. So, essentially, where's my coffee? Essentially what I'm doing is, right now, I'm sewing what are called half square triangles. And uh, half square triangles are essentially two pieces of fabric, both the same size, laid on top of each other with, let me grab one of these here, if I can get it up. Two of these laid on top of each other. A line is drawn down the center diagonally on the one, that's lighter, with a pencil. And then you sew a quarter seam, quarter inch seam allowance on either side of that line, cut it in half, fold it back, and you have what is called a half square triangle. And we've got two of those things there. So that's what I have to start with. And again, to show you what this block looks like, these little things right here, the blue and white ones, those are half square triangles. Actually, the larger purple and white ones are also half square triangles. So there's a lot of half square triangles in this block and really yeah you you can't escape half square <laughs> triangles when you're quilting they're pretty much a foundational piece um chris says when it is time to call your craft stuff you could have an online auction remember some people will buy half bottles of ink paint use stamp pads open paper pads etc yeah that's not a bad idea chris um i i thought i did a purge a couple of years ago and cleaned up my uh craft room looking for my coffee and uh, what I did was I donated a lot of stuff to uh, a local school. There's an elementary school not far, about a mile away from where I live. And so I took them up two huge boxes of paper. And they were paper pads. I used to collect paper pads. And I love paper pads. And these were paper pads that I had never opened or I had duplicates of. I have so many of them that I start to buy duplicates not realizing I already owned them. I was a hoarder of paper pads. I love paper. Now I'm a hoarder of fabric. Simple as that. So I took them up to the school and uh, there were two secretaries there and one of them knew me because she had been in one of my scrapbooking classes before. Honestly, I didn't remember her. Sorry. Um, and she said, oh yeah, we'll take those. The kids will love this. The teachers will love it. But before we let the teachers look at them, we're going through them first because we're scrapbookers. I said, you know, as long as they get a good home, I don't care. I took to them probably, well, you know those banker boxes? They were full on their edge. There had to be 50, 60 pads. I mean, the money alone that those represented, really. I mean, because a paper pad runs anywhere from 20 bucks to 35 bucks. So there was probably several, I know, not several, close to probably over $1,000 worth of paper pads. But I wasn't using them. And as I said, many of them had never even been opened. There was still little tape on them that keeps them closed up in the store. And they seemed to appreciate it. And I took some other things up to them and donated. And I donated, to, I gave things away to Value Village, which is a charity shop here in Ontario. Um, all kinds of stuff. Stuff that I hadn't used in a long time, I got rid of. Um, I need to do a purge like that again. Uh, because I could get rid of, I got rid of eight garbage bags full of stuff that was just completely useless. It wasn't donatable, anything like that. And uh, yeah, it gave me a lot of space, but it's time to do it again. But not right now. Like I said, I want to redo that whole room. Um, yeah, so anyways, um, so I'm doing a little sew along here, or craft along, or chat along, whatever you want to call it, just to give us, to alleviate some of the cabin fever we might be feeling these days. And it is kind of scary, isn't it? Um, we're going through this. Life is not normal. So what I'm doing right now is I'm drawing a line from, diagonal, from corner to corner diagonally on each one of these little white squares. And these little white squares are two and a half inches. So we're working with small stuff, and you probably can't see it, but there is a bit of a pattern on this, so I'm looking to make sure I have the wrong side down. So I'm drawing the, I, hope, I think all of these are wrong side down, they are. And so I can just draw my line. Now I'm just using a pencil and a ruler, uh, just a light line, because this line will get cut out of the seam allowance on these. It can be a little tedious doing this part of it, uh, the setup, but it's a necessary evil. So, how is everybody handling 
our little lockdown situation. I guess it's not so little, is it? Um, I'm getting a little antsy. I almost went, was going to go to my new class today. I had a new class um, to do something I've wanted to do for a long time, make what they call a Lone Star Quilt. A Lone Star Quilt is, just as it says, it's a great big huge star. The reason I have put it off is because many of the patterns for Lone Star Quilt call for something called Y seams. Y seams are where three pieces of fabric instead of two all come together and or they're often known as partial seams and they are tricky and everybody seems to go like deer in headlights when you talk about them about uh, Y seams and so I want to learn how to do them so that's why I was taking the class because it was going to be in that class well given the situation and even though it's probably a small class, there's probably only seven or eight people in it, I decided to cancel out. Um, the store has not sent an email or anything saying that they are suspending classes, which I think they should be doing, quite frankly. Uh, it's a small store. Keeping your social distance from people in that store is not easy. It's usually very busy. They have a lot of... Um, you know, customers. Tuesdays especially are usually really busy day, days in that store because they, uh, it's like everybody goes over the weekend period and they need their fix of quilting supplies because they're not open on Sunday or Monday. Um, so yeah, Tuesdays are really a busy day in that store. And because it's the only store in the area, right now. There used to be more, but they've all gone out of business, unfortunately. Um, she's even more busy, because she, basically she's the only thing in town. Um, now, she does have really great prices on most of her fabric and that. Sometimes her notions are a little bit uh, overpriced, and that may just be the nature of, you know, the business. Those smaller, individualized, special tools. Uh, are something that cost a little bit more no matter where you buy them. But uh, some of her things, eh, you, you got to shop around. But her fabric is fantastic. $15 a meter, you can't beat that. Uh, the average for most quilt stores is anywhere from $18 to $22 a meter. And it's all the same stuff, basically, in terms of what it's made of. It's 100% cotton. Um, so, you know, you can't beat her prices on fabric. And if this was a normal Tuesday, I'd be over visiting my mother in the uh, nursing home. Can't do that. They've locked it down. And, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, I said this on my vlog yesterday, if you caught my vlog yesterday. Um, basically, they don't want any visitors there because, you know, they're old people and their immune systems are compromised. Uh, they have other physical ailments, mental, uh, not mental health, well, they could have mental ones too, health ailments and so you know it's a death sentence and you know there were people we were there last week and they asked us all the important questions that they ask have you been out of the side of the country have you come into contact with anybody that's been sick and all that kind of stuff are you feeling sick or anything like that and then they're either dousing you in hand sanitizer as well well yeah and the lady the reception lady at the main desk where you sign in and that she was telling us that some of the people put up a real protest about doing this kind of thing, which <laughs> is ridiculous. But she says, oh, yeah, they get quite angry with her. Well, and she says to them, look, your loved ones are in here. Do you want to kill them? You know, bully for her for saying something like that, because that's true. Um, and now they then they started doing the temperature thing, too, because my sister went later in the week. And then we got an email from the home. We've had several emails from the nursing home stating that they're not allowing any visitors uh, to come in for the foreseeable future. So I got my mother on the phone and uh, said, did you know about this, Mom? She claimed she wasn't quite clear. She had heard something. So with my mother, you never know. So I explained the situation to her and I said, so mom, you better answer your phone because that's the only way I'm going to be able to stay in contact with you. And my mother has this tendency lately of not answering her phone. She claims she gets frustrated, uh, panics, doesn't know why when the phone rings. I guess, I don't know. 
But anyways, I did phone her uh, and she did answer at that point in time and I explained the situation to her. Um, yes, Chris, I am sure you've never been happier living in a rural uh, location. Uh, how true. So, anyways, what was I talking about? I'm doing half square triangles. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe I can't talk and sew at the same time. I don't know. So anyways, back to the store. Um, yeah, so I thought the most prudent thing to do was to not go to the class. And, you know, that was a hard decision in some ways because I was really looking forward to this class. I have all my material, everything ready to go. But I am sure the store will give me a credit. And I wouldn't be surprised if an email comes through today stating that uh, they've decided to suspend all classes until further notice. Walter's shirt making class, which is supposed to be last night, is suspended. Actually, basically, Walter started that because he got this sniffle over the weekend. And he did say that the instructor of that particular course was sort of sniffling away last weekend. So, um... We were sure that the person running the course, we know him fairly well, did not have uh, the virus. But nevertheless, uh, Walter wrote to the store and said he wasn't coming. And he wrote to the instructor and said, uh, look, I have this. I just thought I'd make you aware of it. Because this instructor also has a compromised immune system as well. So he needs to be careful. And uh, he wrote back and says, yep, yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, so he suspended the class, which was the right thing to do, I think. It's a sad thing to do, but it's the right thing. And I imagine that uh, at the, my quilt store, they will do the same in there as well. I'm pretty sure of that. But anyways, maybe I got the ball rolling on that one. We'll see. Um, so we've got about eight people here. So hello, everybody. Um, if you're just joining me now, uh, just to let you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> This is a complete experiment. This is from my sewing room. Uh, a complete experiment in the sense that I have to do a different setup than I'm used to when I do my lives. And, uh, oh, Yeti's here. Hi, Yeti. Um, and uh, I'm making half square triangles right now for a quilt block that I'm doing. So what I'm doing right now is I have a very special foot on my sewing machine here. It's called a quarter inch foot. You can see through it. And all I have to do is basically... Um, I set my my machine up, and it's all computerized, my machine. Um, it's a great machine. This is an expensive machine. This machine retails at, but don't panic, I didn't pay this for it, retails at $14,000. It's an embroidery machine. You've seen my embroidery and things like that, and my main sewing machine. It weighs a ton. That's why I have the little one behind me. That one's my travel machine. It's much lighter. It was considerably cheaper, too, only about $1,100 uh, for it. But I did not pay fourteen thousand for this machine. I only paid um, seventy five hundred, including the tax. I got a really good deal at my quilt store with this. They were having a sale, and uh, when I said to her, "So are you putting?" I called it the dream machine. It's actually technically known as the Janome fifteen thousand Horizon. And uh, when I first saw this machine, somebody else had it in the store, was using it. I thought, "Oh, I want one of those." And I had just bought a couple of months before that my first sewing machine, my 6700P, which was a $3,000 machine that I got for about $2,800. Um, and uh, so, you know, I thought, mm, I, I'll never be able to afford that machine. And I said, so what are you putting that machine on for as a joke? And she said, well, let me tell you. And she said, $7,500, including tax. I said, sold, wrap it. I'm taking it. And I did. And I love it. And I don't regret spending the money on it. It is a great machine. So and everything's automatic on it. So what I do for this, as I said, these half inch, half square triangles, the two pieces are together, right sides together. So that means my wrong sides are topped. I've got my line here. I'm lining up the edge of this foot because it's calibrated for that. Right against my line. I drop my foot. And now I'm just going to sew. And I'm following that line on the edge of my foot but it's going to sew a quarter inch to the left of that line. So let's go. Might be a little fast. Slow that down. That's good. Now, I'm going to do something called chain piecing. And that just means I'm lifting up my foot, but I'm not taking that one. I'm not cutting my thread. So that one square is staying there, dropping my foot, and I'm going to sew the next one. And this is what I'm going to do. It's a faster way of sewing. 
something I could not do when I first got into quilting, but now, hey, I've had practice, so I'm getting better at this. And away it goes. So what are people saying? Laura says, yes, the key to avoid groups of people. Yeah, but for how long? We're social animals, you know? Um... I mean, my first instinct, I said, like, two, our routines on Tuesdays are essentially to go over, visit my mother at around 11 o'clock in the morning. Her lunch is at 12, so when they take her down for lunch, we leave. And then we go out for lunch ourselves. And then we do any shopping that we need to do. And oftentimes that means a stop at the quilt store to pick up supplies we may or may not need. Um... I'm a sucker for fabric, as I said, and they're always getting new fabric in, and I look at it, and I hate this question. I go in, I buy several meters of new fabric, and they always ask me, uh, always, so, what are you going to do with that? And I said, I have no idea. I have no plan. I'm going to put it in my stash, and someday I will use it. Okay, can you say hoarder? Because that, in a sense, is what I probably am. So like I said before, I used to hoard scrapbook paper, now I hoard fabric. So now I've finished the ones that I want to do at the moment, so I'm going to cut my thread, have an automatic cutter, it makes life so much easier. And you can see I've got a whole chain. Here they are, looks like a kite. And all I do is I just take it, flip them over, so now I'm going to sew on the other side of the line, but it's the same thing to the left because I flipped everything in reverse and just drop my foot down and away I continue. So this is a very fast way of making half square triangles. As I said, half square triangles, you cannot escape them. I had a quilt that I did at the quilt store about a year ago called Dynamic Duel. It was the black and white one. I did show it. I don't know if you remember it. Probably don't. Because um, these things are probably not important in other people's lives. Because if you're not a quilter. Um, but it was 420 half square triangles. I got really good at making half square triangles at that point. Because that was a lot. And uh, actually, I don't mind making half square triangles. It, it, it's a little, it's not tedious, but it's one of those jobs, you know, where, well, right now you can see I'm talking and sewing at the same time because, in a sense, it's almost mindless. You don't have to really concentrate that hard on doing these. And so, so here are all my squares now. They're not half square triangles yet. You see, they're all attached still. And now, my handy dandy scissors, I wear these around my neck when I sew because. They're always with me. In fact, I sometimes go out of the house still wearing them. I guess that's a sign of a true quilter when you start wearing your equipment as accessories. So all I'm doing is I'm just clipping the connecting threads on all of these. And once I have that done, I have to take these and cut them apart. I gotta cut them along that line that's there. And that will give me two triangles, which then I take a iron to, fold over, and they make a half square triangle. So what's what are people saying here? I'm dividing my tension between the two. Um, Virginia says, I have an old Janome memory craft 1001, which has really been a great machine. It has the auto threader. Yes, so does this one as well. And in fact, I had a little problem with the auto threader when I first got it. Um, it only works with certain sizes of threads and needles, uh, and you got to be careful of that. And I tried to force it, and I bent a little tiny, there's a little tiny wire that goes through the needle hole and takes the thread with it, and that's how it threads it. And if that's off, you're screwed. You need a professional to straighten it up or put a new one on, and so I had a new one put on. And so now I'm very careful about that, but yes, it is marvelous to have that because I don't know about you but my eyesight sucks when it comes to looking at things close up and I just can never see the damn hole to get it in so that is a feature I really like on this machine now um, Virginia is your machine an embroidery machine because I've never heard of the 1001 so I'm just curious about that because it is an older machine as you said um, 
Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, yeah, Virginia. I, I do the same thing. I'm always constantly wearing threads. There are threads all over my house. In fact, this morning I had the robo upstairs vacuuming away because it's Tuesday, and usually every other Tuesday my cleaning lady comes, and this would have been her scheduled day. Another reason why our routine on Tuesdays, especially when she's here, is to get out for the day and usually go shopping for things that we need, visit my mother, etc., have lunch. I canceled her uh, yesterday. Um, she has two young kids at home. She's a single parent. And even though we're feeling fine, it, Walter just has the sniffles and that, um, I just felt that for her own safety, uh, why push it, okay? We can clean the house ourselves too, and our house isn't, that, isn't a mess, really, with the exception of this area I'm sitting in. Um, you know, uh, so we canceled her and said we'll reevaluate the situation when the next round of cleaning comes up and we'll see how things are. I just did not want her to feel obligated to come and do it. It is her business and I feel bad about that because when she doesn't clean, she doesn't get paid. And I am sort of thinking of giving her half pay for that. But she is an industrial cleaner as well. She goes in after hours into office buildings and stores and things and she does clean there too. Um, she makes a fairly good livelihood, but, you know, this is all part of her income. And so I'm thinking, well, we pay her $120 a time, and she's here about three hours, sometimes less if she sometimes brings a helper with her. And that's fine. Um, but, you know, uh, it is her livelihood. So I haven't broached the subject with Walter yet, but I'm sort of thinking that maybe we could give her... Uh, since we were kind of canceling her, give her half, you know, uh, give her $60, just sort of because of the inconvenience. I don't know. Um, you know, in some ways, too, it's not that we're made of money. We're not. This is one of the luxury items, though, that I did not give up when I retired because people said to me, um, why... Okay, this isn't working. Um... I need uh, a little cutting mat right here. But, okay, let me finish my sentence for a second because I need to go out of camera shot to get another cutting mat. Um, people said to me when I retired, so you're keeping your cleaning lady? Yes. Well, why? You'll be home all the time. You can do it yourself. Yeah, that's true. But, no, I don't want to. There are better things to do with your time in your life than clean. Okay? I like a clean house. I like to keep it neat and tidy. Um... But I figured the 120 bucks uh, every other week is worth it. Um, it gives me more time to sew. So there you are. But we're not made of money, okay? And right now, and as you know, on Stephen and Walter Live on Saturday, we were talking about, or yeah, on Sunday, we were talking about, you know, what, the possibility of us losing a lot of money because of the trips that we had planned and have paid for kind of a thing. So, yeah... I'm hoping the cruise company, the River Cruise Company, uh, decides to do what a lot of the cruise companies are and give us back our money, basically. But that's going to, that is scheduled for the middle of May, and they're holding off until at least the end of April. They've made some decisions about cruises that would be going right now, and they did give those people back their money and, or cruise credits for future cruises. So we'll see what happens. Um, right now, I want to take the money and run. It's a lot of money a lot of money so um virginia says the machine uses a large memory card transfer design so it's obviously oh yes yes uh this machine is wireless it works with your wi-fi so you can transfer your designs from your computer to it that way and you it also takes the usb stick and that's what i put all my designs on and yeah so i don't have to worry about that and uh Virginia, uh, Chris says, that would be nice and also keep you on our list for reinstatement after this is all over. I'm not worried about her getting rid of us, though. Uh, the reason is we've had her for probably 20 years. And um, we're good to her, okay? Uh, at Christmas time, we give her a gift, plus we give her money. Uh, you know, we basically give her uh, a paid leave, in a sense. Uh, with that, we, we give her, you know, uh, a, the equivalent of one times cleaning salary and that kind of thing. Um, she sometimes runs into problems with her kids. Um, 
you know, where she has to stay home or whatever, or she can't get a babysitter or whatever. That was when they were a little younger. Now they're in school. Of course, right now, Ontario closed down all the schools for three weeks. You know, there's the March break right now and then two weeks after that. So, you know, she still has to work. So I don't know what she's doing. I think she has somebody that looks after her kids when she's working most of the time. But like I said, sometimes that person, there's a problem with that. And so we've basically said, or and she does suffer from migraines too. In fact, this is why I had to make this decision. And it was a difficult one because uh, two weeks ago, which was her last time to come, she couldn't come. She had a migraine. Um, and, you know, I don't suffer from migraines, but from what I hear, they're pretty bad. And so she said, you know, she could reschedule for later in the week or something. And I says, don't worry about it. We'll just carry on with our regular schedule uh, that we have. And uh, she was fine with that. So I'm not worried about her removing us from the list or anything like that. But, you know, um, we've had her for 20 years. So, you know, I want to treat her right, too, uh, with all of this. So I'll have to discuss that with Sleeping Beauty upstairs whenever he gets up. Yeah, it's only 9.49. He won't be up for a while. Um, even a quarter payment would be a lovely token. Yeah, yeah, I, I want her to know that we appreciate the situation she may find herself in uh, as well with all of this. So, yeah, we'll see. Ooh, wow, we've got 10 people now. Ooh, <laughs> almost as many as we have Stephen and Walter live on a Sunday. I don't know what that what it is. Uh, I don't know if my stuff isn't categorized properly or we just are boring. Because even my vlogs, really... I'm small-time potatoes, very small-time potatoes. Um, I'm ecstatic when, in a week's time, I might have over, slightly over 100 views on either the rebroadcast of Stephen and Walter Live or on my YouTube channel, um, my vlog. Um, I don't know. Give me one second here. I'll be right back. I just need to grab a small cutting mat. And I'm back and did you miss me? Um, I found a little small cutting mat. Actually, this is kind of a cool one because it rotates like on a Lazy Susan. And the reason for that is certain things that you may need to cut, you need to get at, you know, different angles. And this helps with that. Instead of having to lift up the piece, you just swing the board. I have a larger one of these too. And I need a rotary cutter. A quilter's essential tool is a rotary cutter. Oh, thanks, Laura. Uh, yeah, Chris, I, I add, well, they're not hashtags, they're tags, though I do add those in uh, as well. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's just, I don't know how you, how some stations, why some channels just blossom. Like Alex on um, Curiosity Inc. Now, of course, this stuff's kind of interesting. Yeah, my light goes off every now, it's on a timer thing. Um, yeah, his stuff is really quite interesting, and I follow him, and he's the guy that had the Potter's House, and we've talked about that one before, and I know some of you uh, probably watch him as well. In fact, I'm hoping to uh, go to his store in uh, the end of June. That is, given what the travel situation is going to be like, because we're booked to go to Edmonton and Calgary, and he's in Calgary. And um, we have the flights, we have the hotels, we have everything booked, because it's the Canadian National uh, Quilt Show. And uh, we want to go to see that. And that's in Edmonton. Calgary's three hours away from Edmonton. We'll have a rented car. Uh, my friend Kim, who runs the Quilters Way, she's uh, in Calgary as well. And uh, we'd like to meet up with her, too, and the whole bit. And so Curiosity Inc.'s in Calgary. So we were going to go to his store. And maybe he'd be there and we'd actually meet him. And I'd do a little video and, and whatnot. However, who knows what's going to happen now. In fact, I'm pretty much I'm pretty much resigning myself to the fact that we aren't going anywhere for quite a long time. Okay, if we get out to pick up our mail, that might be an excursion in itself, <laughs> kind of a thing. So, anyways, he has like he puts up a video within an hour. He has well over, uh, um, you know, fifteen thousand views or more. I don't know. I, I don't know. But, you know, I don't do it for that anyways. You know, I'm happy with the with the people who come on a regular basis, like most of you. 
you're my regular viewers on Stephen and Walter Live. Um, and that's great. And I appreciate you. Um, you know, other, some other channels, they, they have it so you can join and you pay so much each month. Well, I'm not doing that. And Patreon, I've talked about Patreon before. And um, yeah, I feel that you need to give back. If people are going to give you money, you have to give them something for their money. Well, I don't have time to figure out how to give what to give people uh, and spend all my time doing that. And as I said, this is not a business. I'm just cutting these in half. And that did not cut well. I may have to stand up for this, and that means I'll be probably out of the shot. I may need a new blade. I think I need a new blade. Okay. So let me fix this one up, and then I'm going to put a, a new blade in this. This is what you get. Little triangles. Okay, and then I'll show you what we're doing with that afterwards. But I'm going to grab, I'm going to go out of shot for just a sec. I'm grabbing a, a replacement blade, if I can find one. Here we go. So isn't this exciting? You get to see me. Oh, hi, Cindy. Chris says, I started watching you because of a mini album you made. Then started watching Walter and Steve Live. Loved your sense of humor, honesty, and you created interesting interactive conversation. Well, thank you, Chris. That's very nice of you to say. Um, we try. How I got started in making YouTube uh, stuff, or why well, I started my YouTube channel, um, and I forget exactly what, when I did my very first video. you got to be careful with these things. These are extremely sharp. So, um, I started it as a craft channel because I was recording what I was doing with, um, you know, my various projects, scrapbooking and things like that, and then the album making, and then I got into mixed media and, jour and art journaling and all that kind of stuff. And then I one day I got, well, I had been watching several live YouTube things, and I thought, well, I wonder if I could do that. So I started experimenting with the equipment I had, and I still have fairly primitive equipment, okay? Um, and there it is. That's how you replace the rotary blade. Um, there's a little oil on it. I need to very carefully wipe it off. They packed them with a little oil. I don't know why. There must be a reason, but I'm not sure what it is. Okay, that should make life easier. So as I was saying, I decided that, I said to Walter one time, we should do a live show and just chat about things and try it and see how it works out. I figured Walter would say no, but surprisingly he said, yeah, let's give it a go. So we did, and the rest is history. Um, it would be nice to have more people, and we have tried different things over time on how to pull people in. Um, Art Attack usually pulls some people in, but still. Uh, you know, you see a live, somebody has a live, comes up, and they have thousands of people in the live, literally. Um, and then the, they also turn on, some of them turn on this thing called, uh, what's it called? Brain fart. Um, oh, somebody out there probably knows what it's called, but basically you can give people money online for it. Um, and their comment gets raised to the top of the list. In my way of thinking, that's kind of useless. But people seem to do it. Melody Lane, if you know who she is, she does, she's a cricket representative, you know, for the electronic car, uh, die cutting machine. And she goes on live every Saturday morning. And she does some other lives at other times. And people are constantly just giving her money. Now, I mean, her videos are very good. She's explaining how to use the ins and outs of the cricket machines and the whole bit. But this is her livelihood. This is her business. And it's been very, very successful. I mean, it took her time, I'm sure, to get up to that level. But everybody knows Melody Lane in the crafting community. And she makes lots and lots of money. Other people have been successful that way, too. And I don't know what the secret formula is, how you do that. But... That's okay. Um, I don't want you to think that I'm disappointed in any of this. I'm not. I am monetized, as you know, 
uh, for advertisements, and I make a glorious $100 every four months. Big money. Yeah. And of course, it's based on the number of people you have watching your videos and all that kind of stuff and how many click the like. And you will notice something I do not say in my videos. Click the like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Okay, I don't say any of that kind of stuff because one, I figure people know that. And two, I'm not going to beg for recognition here. Um, I don't do it for that. I do it because it's part of my hobby system. I like doing it. I like doing this that we're doing right now. I'm not getting a hell of a lot done, but I like doing it. Okay, and it's saving me from talking to myself. Meanwhile, Walter's still in bed asleep. So, anyways, um, how would I get on all that? I was talking about Alex. Now people get all of this. I don't know. Um, super chat. That's right, Laura. Um, yeah, couldn't remember that. You know, to me, that's bogus. I mean, super chat. Why are people giving other people money? It's like a tip. And not getting thing, anything. Well, I guess they're getting something in return. I guess there's a form of entertainment. But either people have more money than brains or what. I don't know. In fact, I, I wouldn't start a super chat. Let's see if this thing's going to cut. Oh, yeah. Makes a lot of difference when you have a new blade. Um, I... What was I going to say about the super chat? Um, y you know, you're, you're taking money from people for doing nothing. It's the way I look at it. And in another way of thinking about it, too, I suppose it is a tip system. But I'd be afraid that nobody would, I wouldn't get any money. Nobody would give me a cent um, kind of thing. So I'm not putting myself in that situation. Um, so don't worry. I have never charged for any of the stuff I do, and, and right now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm never going to charge one way or the other. I will have them monetized, um, take my little hundred bucks every four months, and run. Yeah, simple as that. Um, it sends, Virginia says, it sends their comment to the top by paying Super Chat. Yeah, so why would you want that? I suppose that there's a lot of people in the chat, but you want to know something too about chats, and this is something I am very proud to say about you people. I watch chat. Uh, I watch several other live videos um, that come on, and a lot of times people who are in the chat situation just want to talk about themselves and not about what's going on on the channel. Um, you know, oh, hi, I'm cleaning my oven. Well, isn't that nice, bully for you? Um, oh, hi, I've been sick. Well, I'm sorry for that. We all get sick, you know, at some point in time. You know, what I'm saying is it, it's really not a contributory comment to the conversation. Now, not that necessarily am I looking for people to be, um, you know, philosophical, earth-shattering with their comments, whatever, uh, kind of a thing. It's nice to have just a general chat about stuff, and that's fine. And I, I do enjoy hearing about other people's lives, too, because, you know, this is sort of an international kind of thing here. I mean, right now, we've got people from Canada, we've got people from the U.S., we've got people from Holland, and we've got people from Australia. And I don't know if I missed anybody, and if I did, let me know. Um, but, uh, you know, and that's kind of nice, and it's nice to hear what's going on in their parts of the world too but I'm not going to charge people for that um Chris says your first YouTube was you seven years ago oh my god album in a box your first live with Walter I think was September 16th 2017 seven years ago has it been that long well I guess because I've been retired now for almost eight years come this June I've been retired eight years I retired June, end of June 2012. And it was shortly thereafter I started doing YouTube videos because before then I really didn't have time as a teacher. I was doing teacher stuff, you know, right, Laura? You know what that's all about. Um, so that's really interesting. I haven't realized that, that that was my first one. Now, here's a question for you, Chris. Can you still access my very first videos? Because for some reason I can't. Um, I don't know why that is. And I wondered if there's a limit and that some of the older ones YouTube removes. Um, 
So, I don't know. Um, yes, okay. That's good to know. I'll have to go in and try that. Maybe I have to go in under like an anonymous name or something to see all of that because I don't think I even have a copy of my first videos anywhere. It'd be kind of fun to go back. There you go. There's an idea. I've never done one of these. It's called a premiere. You probably know what that is. A premiere is... Let me set my coffee down here. I need to bring my table over because my iron is sitting here. Um, I... What was I talking about? God, my train of thought goes right off the tracks. Um... Yeah, Premiere is basically, from what I understand, you have a video you've uploaded and then you can make it like a live, but the video is playing and you chat with other people that come on for the Premiere about the video. I really don't understand the purpose of that, but apparently a lot of people do it and I have the option, I can do it too. Um, so maybe what would be interesting is to do that, do a Premiere with one of my very earliest vlog videos or one of the first Stephen and Walter lives and criticize it. <laughs> um, you know, cut myself up. That might be kind of fun. I could have a lot of fun with that. I don't mind making uh, humor about myself. I don't. Okay? Um, life's too short to get too overly serious about, you know, your life. And to be honest, I have spent my life... Uh, Oh, now I'm going to get serious. I was bullied as a cop, as a kid, but we didn't call it bullying those days. We called it kids being kids, okay? But I did. I got picked on. I got beat up a lot, okay? Um, being a gay man later in life, uh, there was all kinds of negative things there that happened as well. I survived. I don't need to have anybody feel sorry for myself, and I'm not feeling sorry for myself because... You know, what's that expression? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Well, that's true. That's true. Um, but it made me strong enough to be able to laugh at myself. And I always feel that if I can make other people laugh with me, that's great. If people are laughing at me, well, I tend to want to think of it not in that way. I like to think of it that they're laughing with me. If they're laughing at me, they're an idiot. Whatever. Do I need them in my life? Not really. It happens. But I'm not going to take... Life's too short to get too serious about a lot of th little things like that. I had a person tell me once a long time ago, pick the mountain you want to die on. And I kind of like that philosophy. It basically is stating that there's so many things in our life that matter not. And if we don't make them into a huge concern, then we can just move on past them. And I like that philosophy. Um... Laura, I do. she has quizzes to mark today. Oh, Laura. Ah, it's so nice to be retired. I hate it marking. I absolutely hate it marking. And Laura's an English teacher, as I was, and it never ends. That is the bane of your existence as a, a, an English teacher, because there's always marking. And it's very long and complicated marking. I mean, essay marking is not fun. Ironically, I love teaching kids how to write essays properly, but I didn't like marking them. Um, Laura, the other Laura says, I love your channel because we discuss real topics that affect all of us. Plus your vlog teaches how to do various craft projects. Same with Idiot Quilter. Again, thank you, Laura. Whoa, this is really good for my ego today. Thank you, people. <laughs> You're making me feel good. I'm not getting a lot of quilting done, but that's okay. I enjoy, I'm not on a timeline for this. Okay. It's a hobby. Don't you love, I used to, when I taught scrapbooking classes, people would always come into the store that I was teaching and working at at the time and they'd say, oh, I'm so far behind. I've got to get caught up. I've got this album to do. I've got to get this done. I've got to get that done. The whole bit. And I used to say to them, it's a hobby. You're never caught up. It's never done. Because if it was caught up and it was all done, what, would you go, what are you going to do next? It's supposed to be enjoyable. Why put the stress on yourself as a hobby uh, by putting on a timeline? I mean, sure, you might be making a gift for somebody, so you do have a deadline for that. But for the most part, you're doing it for yourself, and it's ongoing. So why worry about it? I mean, it's supposed to relieve stress, not give you stress. Um, Laura says, I have three years to retire after this year. 
Oh, Laura, it will go by very fast. Believe me. And you'll love it. Um, Chris says, I was bullied and suffered from gaslighting as an adult. Love your brave attitude about it. I'm not there yet. I agree with you, Laura Weil. Okay. Yeah, um, people can be cruel. Simple as that. And I said the other day on my vlog, I think, too, that, you know, they talk about that bad times bring out the best in people. Yeah, I don't think it does. I think bad times bring about the worst in people, i.e., I need toilet paper. Oh, yeah, I need tons and tons of toilet paper. Like, they're never going to make toilet paper again. Come on. I need to go to the grocery store and stock up on everything. Like, the food chain has not been disrupted by this. Well, not by a significant amount. But people go into this panic mode. I mean, I have to admit, I got caught up in the mob mentality too. I said on my vlog, we checked out Walmart or not Walmart, we checked out uh, Costco and checked the toilet paper. There wasn't any, but we already had toilet paper. And we went to Walmart and there were two big packages left. We grabbed them and paid twenty three fifty a thing, like which was a gouge. Um, I'm not doing that anymore. We have enough, okay? We have enough other stuff in the house too. I mean, I thought it was really funny. I think I mentioned this. Walter went into Walmart uh, last week and he was just checking out what kind of things were missing. All the pasta was gone except the whole wheat pasta. So I guess you can still be picky in a time of a crisis. You only get the one kind of pasta. You're not touching that dry whole wheat shit, right? <laughs> so go figure. Um, yeah, Laura says, people can be just plain ignorant. It's annoying. Yeah, I think it depends on the person you are. Bad times bring out the true character of people. And that's very true, Laura says. Yeah, I think it does. I think it, it does. And, you know, it's early in this crisis situation that we're in in the world now. And I would like to hope and think that we are going to hear stories, and we need some good news stories right now, don't we, of people helping other people out. I've been trying to think of things that I could do in what I do as a hobby that, you know, I could do for other people. Um, you know, um... I don't know, does the world need more quilts? Uh, I can't make quilts that fast uh, to give to people. I was trying to think of some little project or something that would be fast, but would be appreciated by other people who can't do this kind of thing or don't do this kind of thing. I don't know. Anybody got any suggestions? I'll take suggestions on that. Um, Virginia says, I bought the artisan whole wheat pasta yesterday. Even that was almost gone. Yeah. I love whole, uh, while wheat whole wheat pasta and bread has a nutty flavor yeah i don't mind it but i find it kind of dry i don't know might be just psychological uh with it i don't hate it and i mean definitely if if i was desperate and i needed pasta i'd go for the whole wheat no problem i'm not gonna leave it um in our walmart said cindy says it was the toilet paper and baked beans that were empty <laughs> now there's something because um I don't know about other people, but I know what baked beans usually do to people. And yeah, you need toilet paper with that too, don't you? I love baked beans. I do. And I do have several cans in my cupboard. Um, actually, just we're just talking about whatever here, okay? So again, I'm supposed to be quilting. Um, there's an easy way to, to simulate, make faux baked beans, the easy way. Um, you know, like regular baked beans, if you make them right from scratch, you go out, you get the dry beans, you soak them overnight, or you boil them first, then you boil them and you add your ingredients like brown sugar, tomato sauce or paste or whatever you use. Some people throw in a little ketchup. Um, there's different recipes, your spices, everything like that, and you bake them and they're great. They're wonderful. You might use molasses in it too. My mother's recipe calls for molasses in it. Well, there's a cheater way. You take a can of baked beans or a couple of cans, throw them into a baking dish, mix in some uh, brown sugar, uh, some uh, prepared mustard, you know, just regular yellow mustard, or if you want to get fancy, you can have some gray poupon on it, or Dijon uh, mustard, a uh, little pepper, uh, salt to taste, um, add in some ketchup, 
okay? Or if you've got some leftover pasta sauce or something like that, uh, throw that in. Mix it all together. Um, you can add in a little bit of garlic powder if you wish, a little bit of onion powder, uh, any other kind of little spices you might want. Stir it all around, put it in a baking dish, bake it for about 20 minutes, heat it all through, and it tastes just like homemade baked beans. Nobody will know. And uh, I've done that a few times in a pinch, you know, rather than spend the time to make the regular baked beans. It tastes great. Throw on a wiener. You know, whatever. Um, uh, I guess you need both, yeah. Uh, Chris says, there's a pharmacist here that ha that is having her dad hand deliver medication and basic essential grocery items to elderly and immune system compromised customers. Well, that's nice. Um, you know, so there you go. The best of people is coming out. So I stand corrected on that comment I made. Um... Laura says, that reminds me, I need one of my prescription. I order it in. Uh, oh, and Vine says, and add some bacon and onion, and I'm there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course you can. If you've got some leftover ham, cube it. Throw that in. That's good, too. Yeah, it is. It's a simple recipe. It's all done freehand. Uh, I have no... Somewhere I could probably find it, because my mother used to do this, and I probably have her recipe card for it. Um, but really, I just freehand it, and it turns out every time, and it's good. And... You know, I have served it to people, uh, you know, had sort of like a bunch of people over and had buffet style dinner and had, you know, like pasta and things like that. I had baked beans and they all thought they were from scratch. I usually end up telling them they're not because I can't keep a secret, but um, they're all surprised at that. And it's easy. It's really easy. Um. Virginia says, I think it's time to paint some rocks with inspirational words and place them around my neighborhood. Um, that's kind of a neat idea. Is anybody going to be out, though, on the streets to see them? But, yeah, that would be, wouldn't that be interesting? Uh, you get up, you open up your front door, and there's a rock that says, um, you're awesome, or something like that on it. That would probably make somebody's day, you know? Something simple like that. And that's what I'm saying about quilting or doing some kind of art project or something that... I want it to be something useful, but something quick and easy to do, um, not really time consuming, you know, that I could donate to nursing homes or something like that. Um, I don't know. I haven't come up with any ideas yet. Maybe I should do a Pinterest sh search because they often have a lot of really good ideas. But I try to stay away from Pinterest because I got kind of in the habit of checking that out a lot and making lists of possible projects and things. And I never went and did them because I overwhelmed myself with too many ideas. Um, so, anyways, back to my quilting. So, now I've got all these little triangles, and what I'm going to do is press them open. And I have my trusty iron right here. Um, this is not my, this is not the iron I usually use. I usually have the bigger one, it's over on the other end, but because of the sake of I didn't want to have to get up and down, because basically the camera, which is my iPad, uh, is kind of in a fixed position. I uh, have this little camera over here. So this is what happens. You press them open and that's your half square triangle. Now you see this little dog here, here. So what I do have to do after I've done these, press them open, is I have to square it up. And I have a little, these are two inch, two and a half inch. They become, are they do they become two and a half inch? I gotta check my pattern for this. Um, ooh, I think there's a little bit of gunk on my iron. No, I think it's on my pad. Hmm, that's not good. I'm getting it on my square here. Hope it comes off. Yeah, it seems to be coming off. Well, that's good. Um, and you square it up. So I'll have to check my instructions for that and see what I need to do uh, with all of that. And an expression you will hear quilters use all the time when they're pressing. It's called press to the dark side. Sounds like, um, just checking my iron here. I think I still got gunk on this. Okay, I have to clean off that iron because it's making marks on my squares. Uh, pressing to the dark side means you press your seam allowance over towards the darker fabric. And the reason is 
then your little seam allowance when you get the quilt together doesn't show up through your light piece. And usually you can do that, but sometimes you can't. But uh, this has definitely got gunk on it. And so I'm going to be right back. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. I need to draw, grab a dryer sheet and I'll show you why. Okay, I'm back. Dryer sheet. Now what you're going to say, what are you going to do with the dryer sheet? This is how you clean off your iron bottom. You take the dryer sheet and you just lay it down and, and I'll use a little steam and lo and behold this cleans the bottom of your iron off really nice. Now you can buy things that are um, actually it might clean off your pad too. You can buy creams and things that you can spread on the bottom of a warm iron and you wipe it around, it takes off the residue as well. But what happens is sometimes that cream goes into the holes in the bottom of your iron, your steam iron, and plugs them up. This doesn't plug anything up and it smells nice. So let's see if that has solved my problem. And it has. And that is a good thing. So I have all of these to press. You can see that there is still a little suspicious of this. No, I guess it's okay. Um, you can see when, when you're doing something like a quilt and all these pieces, there is a lot that you have to do before you get the block done. Now, mind you, if I wasn't doing this as a live and talking to you right now, um, oops, I pressed that to the wrong side. Okay, pressed to the dark side. Um, I'd have this a lot more of this done. But like I said, I'm not on a time scheme here. This does not have to be done for a certain date. Um, and that's fine. I might switch mats. Because I think I still got gunk on this mat. And I don't want gunk on my triangles here. And sorry, I'm not paying attention to comments at the second at the moment here, and I should be. And there's no reason why I can't. I can just move my phone over here while I'm doing this. So let's see. Yeah, it is a, it, it is a good tip. Um, hi Aunt B. Glad you're here. Um, ooh, there's lots of suggestions here. Let's see. Um, you could try fidget blankets for the elderly. Yeah, um, I thought of that. But again, and that is a good idea. Because I know other people who make fidget blankets and donate them to nursing homes and things like that, and they're very well received. Um, the problem is, what I'm thinking of right now is, I want something that's quick and fast. Because a fidget blanket actually does take some time. And something where I can make a lot of something um, in a relatively short period of time. That's what I'm kind of looking for. Um, leave books at bus stops or other undercover areas around the neighborhood with a note, free book. Oh, that's an idea. You know, I have seen um, in certain places in our travels, people have on a street corner or in front of their house, they've built a little wooden box uh, with a window in it, and uh, inside are some books. And it says, you know, free for the taking. And it's sort of like a, like a library. Uh, people will borrow a book from it, and oftentimes bring a book and put it into that spot, and other people, they share it. And I think that's a really great idea, you know. Um, thing is, I don't read physical books anymore. I read all electronically. In fact, I used to have a house full of books. And over the years, I have slowly gotten rid of most of my physical books because 
and I won't buy a physical book now. If, if I can get it in electronic format, I get it from electronic format. Now, I was one of those people who used to say, I will never go that way because I love the feel of a book, and I do. But the advantage of reading an electronic book, I have found, is that I have a Kobo, which is like a Kindle, only it's the Canadian version of, of that kind of thing. And um, it, wherever I've left off in the Kobo, my iPhone will pick it up. So I am never without a book with me. So if I'm waiting for somebody or something, an appointment, whatever, I can pull out my iPhone and just carry on reading my book. And that is what I like. I can't do that with a physical book. Well, I could. I could carry it around with me. But the thing is, I don't have a purse. And I've always said that men need purses. Okay? Because uh, we, the amount of stuff we carry in our pockets, in our wallets, uh, you know, and you're limited with what you can get into your pocket. Whereas a woman has a purse, she can carry a lot of stuff uh, with that. But since I don't have a purse... Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I don't want to be carrying an extra bag around with me uh, when I go shopping or whatever, so um, an iPhone does it for me. So I like that format, so I don't have any physical books. So, let's catch up, turn on some light. Um... Well, I hope you do. Um, it's not my intent, Laura, to be a teacher online, but, you know, whatever comes to my mind, I just share it with everybody else. It's how I've learned a lot of things people have shared with me. Chris says her husband has a purse. Well, yeah, but Chris, <laughs> we know why he has a purse, don't we? Um, which is fine. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a man carrying a purse, for whatever reason, really. I mean, we tend to call them messenger bags, or something like that, or I have heard them called merce, a merce. Um, you know, it's very practical. But for some reason in our society, you know, uh, men just don't have that... Well, society doesn't seem to accept the fact that man might want to have a purse, although that's probably changing. Um... Tote. Yes, a tote. And I do carry totes, okay? Uh, when I have something large I need to take somewhere or something like that, and I've made some totes, so I've got them. I use them. Yeah. Oh, Shelly. Hi, lovely. Sending smiles from Birmingham, UK. Okay, thanks, Shelly, for joining us. I don't know if I've ever seen you on here before, uh, like when we do our regular lives. So that's really nice. Um... Cindy says, my husband says he doesn't need one because I have one. Oh, so you get to pack rack everything with it. Okay, the next thing I need to do here is I need to trim these down to, uh, I think they've got to be two and a half inch. I make sure, where's my sample here? Oh, they're smaller than that. Hmm. Did I screw up? Where's my ruler? Oh, there it is. Uh, these trim down to one and a half inches. No, so that would be a quarter inch on either side. So, no, you trim them down to about two inches. Okay, so I'm right. I'm right. I just need to trim them down. So, I'll show you how you trim them down, but I need to get up again and get a ruler. Sorry. thought I was better prepared for all of this. Okay, I've got a couple of rulers here that I can use. So I'm going to pull up my little mat here and show you. Now this is a two and a half inch square. And this is where the little rotating mat comes in really handy. So you put it down. And there's a diagonal line on this. And this is what you use to line it up. And since I'm cutting these down to two inch squares... 
I'm just going to get it so that that line goes from corner to corner and first thing I do is I trim off the overhang on two of the sides and then we just rotate this around so the other two sides now I line it up so that it's at the two inch mark on both the left side and the right side because I know those two sides are absolutely straight and trim off the overhang and now we have a two inch half square triangle which will go into this quilt now those still seem small to me am I losing it okay you lose a quarter inch on all sides of this in a quilt because that's your seam allowance so yeah it should be fine we'll find out when I sew it in yeah it's been a while since I've worked on this quilt and this is why I'm getting a little confused here uh, about things so I do know what I'm doing really I do and I'm getting covered in pieces of fabric so what's everybody saying um oh Shelly you just found me well welcome I hope you'll come and see our regular Stephen and Walter live on Sundays and my vlog on Mondays and you'll find links for that if you just do a search for bland designs you'll find my vlog or do it with my name Stephen Bland with a V and a B L A N D and uh, actually there is another Stephen Bland with a YouTube channel but you'll know he's not me because I am Caucasian and he looks like he may be Indian in background uh, so definitely different people um, yeah uh, oh thank you Shelly that's really kind of you to say <laughs> Cindy says he does as long as it doesn't clash with his outfit <laughs> um, no thanks for the prompt there uh, or the uh, promo Chris And Laura. Yeah, it is. Uh, because you got to get back into Aunt B. you got to get into, again, the instructions and the whole bit and figure out where you left off. And uh, that's what I'm having a little trouble with right now. Yes, we are a friendly and chatty bunch. And you want to know something I was saying before? Um, I may not have a lot of subscribers. And a lot of people who are regular viewers, but the ones I have are, oh, I know what I did wrong. The ones that I have are quality. So it's quality over quantity. I think this is a two and a quarter inch, and I want to go to two inches. That's why this square, where is it? This square looks too big. Where's that other ruler? I had another ruler out here. Oh, yeah, right here. Okay. This one I've actually marked off with tape showing the two inch square. So let's just measure this and see what I've got. No, that's right. I'm right. Okay. I'm losing it, people. Well, what I'll do is I will put together a test block with these. And hopefully it's not a test, test block, but it'll be the real thing. Actually, that's pretty close. I don't think I need to... Uh, no, I think I better trim. Okay. So. We've been on here now for what? Hmm. Been on here for about an hour and 15 minutes or so. And uh, thank you for hanging in there with me or keeping me company. And that's a nice thing. And uh, so, what else shall we chat about? Um, I don't know. What are people doing to keep themselves amused while they're sort of shut in with all of this? Or are you shut in? Um, 
to be honest, I'm kind of afraid to go out. <laughs> um, well, I, only because I don't want, I want to, you know, do what our government and health authorities are suggesting we do. But, you know, I'm one of those kind of people that needs to get out just for whatever. Back many, many years ago, last century actually, I um, was on an educational improvement leave. I was actually writing a book for the board at the time, and this will definitely date it. Uh, I was writing a book on a Commodore 128 about using computer technology with language across the curriculum that we called it at the time. And uh, that's what I got the, they called them an EIL, Educational Improvement Leave, for. And they were paying me, I think at the time, about 70% of my salary. And I was working every day on this book, the only book I've ever written in my life, and now it's very, very much obsolete, uh, given the fact that I wrote that in about 1987, 88, 89. And uh, technology has definitely changed since those days. Um, but I was all alone in the house at the time, doing this, working every day in my basement, because that's where my office was, and it was in my old house, and my old house basically was a um, two-story in another town, and Walter was at work, and in those days he worked in Toronto, and then I guess actually he may have been working in Oshawa then, um, he switched jobs just shortly after we moved into that house. And so I was there all alone, no social contact. I would actually go up to the local grocery store and buy a green pepper, one green pepper, just to see people. That's the state I was in. So, yeah, being, uh, keeping yourself isolated from other people is actually easier said than done, depending on the type of person you are. Um... Oh, hi, Roy. Nice to see you here. Um, I'm just looking at what other people are saying here. I'm, I'm glad to see that you're also talking amongst yourselves. That's really nice. That's good. It takes the pressure off me <laughs> for keeping the conversation going. Um, Laura says... Oh, no, Shelley says... I'm in isolation due to my lung disease. It's awful. It gives me more chance to sew. That's the way to look at it, Shelley, I think. And Laura says she's afraid to go out too, but this is giving me time to do some more artwork. So you see, we can find a silver lining to all of this. There's a rumor that the whole country, Australia, might go into self-isolation for 14 days around the Easter school holidays if we need to. Wow. Um, well, thanks for the plug, Chris. Yeah, it should have been chocolate. Um, but that was the other problem about working from home in those days, too, that I found. Um, when I get... When I'm isolated, when I'm not getting out, I tend to want to eat. And I tend to want to eat the wrong things. And as such, you know what happens. You put on the weight. And right now, I'm trying to cut back and lose a little weight will make my do doctor happy okay I think I may have screwed this one up a little bit um and it is working but it, as you know I've, we've talked about uh, this diet sort of a thing it's not really a diet per se it's just being conscious of what goes into your mouth and what time it goes into your mouth so basically it's called intermittent fasting and uh, what that means is we don't eat anything before 12 noon and we don't eat anything after 8 o'clock at night. And so we have 16 hours, uh, which part of those 16 hours are you're actually sleeping, where you're fasting. And I have found, and I have tried different diets over the years like everybody else, uh, and I have found this one is working quite well. 
you're, I'm not losing weight fast, but I'm losing some to the point now where I can actually feel comfortable with my shirt tucked in. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't got it tucked in right now. Uh, because when I couldn't tuck in my shirt, <laughs> um, well, I could tuck it in, okay, I wasn't that fat, but the problem was it felt uncomfortable. It felt like, you know, my gut's hanging over the edge kind of a thing, and I don't like that look. I mean, I'm never going to have the body of a 20-year-old, and if I did, I'd have to give it back because I'd probably be abusing it. Um, but this is working. Slowly but surely. And, you know, I just want to feel comfortable. That's all. Uh, I don't want to... Okay, what am I doing here? I obviously cannot do two things at once and talk because I'm not squaring this up worth a crap. Uh, why am I not? What am I doing wrong? Okay, concentrate, you idiot. Let's try this and see. This could be a very wonky block <laughs> when I get this done. Yeah, that was supposed to come off. Okay. So anyways, as I was saying, it's mainly for my health. My blood pressure, for one thing. Apparently, I have slightly elevated blood pressure, and I'm on pills for that. Never had a problem until I met up with this new doctor. My, my old doctor didn't seem to worry about me too much. But uh, she's very thorough. She's youngish. Like, you know. I don't know, probably in her late 30s, could be early 40s. Oh, sounds weird, doesn't it, that I consider somebody in their early 40s young now. Hmm. What's that a sign of? Yeah, old age, my old age. So um, she's very conscious about uh, what I should be doing, and I'll give her credit, she's very thorough. My old doctor, I only saw him once every three years for a physical, basically. She wants to, she sees me every three months. Now, she doesn't give me a full physical, but she sees me every three months. Part of that's because of Walter. She checks up on Walter because he does have some issues that need to be watched. And uh, so when I got her as my new doctor, um, basically she puts me on the same schedule. In fact, Walter and I both go in at the same time. She puts us in separate rooms. I guess she's afraid we'll fight. I don't know. And, uh, but we both have, uh, the same appointment time. So every three months, I'm off to her. Usually have to have blood work done. Although this time, she said I could wait six months for the blood work. So, okay, that's good. As my father used to call the, uh, blood people, the ones that take your blood, the blood, blood letters, the blood suckers. That's what he called them, the blood suckers. Because he used to have his blood taken on a regular basis. And so back here, let's see what people are saying. Um, oh, geez, I missed a lot here. Um, wow, this is going to take me a minute to catch up. Okay. Our, uh, Roy says, loving your genome, my old first PC brother has finally passed after 35 plus tough years. Um, Aunt B says her stepdad has COPD and has us worried as she is acting nonchalant. He is acting a nonchalant about it, but he is saying not much we can do. And that's one of the high risk groups, right? Apparently I'm over 60, so I'm a high risk too. Go figure. Um, Working from home, Laura says, is not as easy as some people think. It's very lonely. Um, yes, it is. Actually, I can tell you a little bit more about that because I used to teach virtual high school. But I'll come back to a minute once I catch up here. Chris doesn't mind the self-isolation as it doesn't really leave the house too much anyways. I'd love a job that I could work from home from. The problem is I can't interview from home. Um... I'm just reading, sorry. Talk amongst yourselves, as you are. Okay. 
Yes, Shelly, it is. It's great to know where everybody's coming from. Jess, sorry, I have to go. Okay, Jetty, no problem. Uh, my husband come out of his bed, had his little bed rest. Tomorrow we have to go to the hospital for his uh, immune therapy against his lung cancer. Oh, well, that's. I hope all that is working out well uh, for you, Jetty, and for your husband. Um... Yeah, so yeah, so I, I see what everybody's talking about here, and yes, the whole situation with this virus is still not good. Um, Toronto, Laura says that Toronto has the highest count so far. It seems to be traveling from east to west, like it started in China, right, and it spread through Indonesia, and now it's they're saying that Europe is the epicenter. And I would not doubt that in a couple of weeks' time, we in Canada, North America, will be in the same situation as uh, most of Europe. It seems to be going that way. And, you know, the part that bothers me more than anything is they're saying it's going to take 18 months to get a vaccine out there. Um... I don't know anything about microbiology and immunizology and all that kind of stuff and how you make a vaccine and stuff to that. I know it takes time. You've got to test it and things like that to make sure, you know, you're not creating a, another poison or more problems in the whole bit. But I can't help but think that these things could be done a little faster if it wasn't for government bureaucracy and for the control and influence that the pharmaceutical companies have on you know medical research and that kind of thing because they are in there like a wet t-shirt that's not even a good metaphor i don't know why i used it um because you know it comes down to the almighty dollar doesn't it still i mean the government our government's talking about all the money that they're at both the federal and the provincial level that they're putting into you know all of this right now to help people out who might lose their jobs while this is going on because of closures, you know, uh, people, you know, with lower income families and that, that this is really taking a toll on them and all that kind of stuff. And that's all great. And it sounds great. But that's the problem. How do these people, how do these corporations get the money? Um, I don't know. Both the federal and provincial level, we were supposedly suffering from a deficit. Now suddenly, where are they coming up with all this money? Is that just they're going to borrow more and put us into more debt? Um, I don't know. I don't know how any of that really works. But I do not, and I base my opinion on the pharmaceutical companies from what happened during the AIDS crisis. Um, the pharmaceutical companies and the governments basically delayed a lot of action that should have been taken um, to, you know, help with that problem. And they didn't. And the excuse is, at least from the gay community, was it was because they called it a gay disease. We know today it was not a gay disease. It was never a gay disease. But the media, the government, pharmaceutical companies, all of that, we're labeling it that. And so, you know, it was okay if uh, gay people died from it. But it was when it started to get spread out more, where people who were not gay or from the LGBT community were starting to con contract it, then the cry went up. And then things started to be done. But it was still very, very slow. And, I mean, that was almost 40 years ago when it began. Actually, it is 40 years. I mean, it's a little longer than 40 years. And do we have a cure for it yet? No, we do not. We have better treatments for it. It's not a death sentence like it once was in the whole bit. But it's taken over 40 years to get to that stage of it. And that makes me worried about this one. Is it going to take that kind of time? Are we going to be living with this like we live with the flu? Well, we have vaccinations for the flu, but it, they're not surefire, as we well know. They help. So, I don't know. I sometimes think that medical science is not long out of the Middle Ages. We're not that far removed from the days when they used to do, you know, bloodletting 
and incantations and things like that. I really don't think we're that advanced. And this situation is probably going to prove that one way or another. So what's everybody saying here? Um, did anyone see the great video from S Spain? No, I didn't. Um, they're locked down. A personal trainer went on the roof of his building, did some exercises, music brought on lookers, and then he ran to a class for them. They all, they all exercising on their balconies. Oh, well, I know they were showing a video from Italy that I guess every night or something, the Italians will come out in front of their homes or off the balconies from their apartments and they bang pots and pans and sing the national anthem and stuff just to, I guess, keep people's spirits up, which I guess if it works, fine, do it. It sounds like a good idea. Laura says, I think pharmaceutical companies generally don't want cures because it means they will lose money for their meds in general. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Um, that whole period ticked me off. We lost so many beautiful and talented people. Yes. Oh, yes, I watched a documentary about that, which was about the Canadian flight attendant and the ignorance of the government doctors at the time. It was called Patient Zero, which, of course, was a lie. Yeah, exactly. There was a lot of lies about it. In fact, I'm reading a book right now, and I mentioned this book by Larry Kramer called The American People, Volume 2. Um, there is a Volume 1. I read it, and it's about the whole AIDS uh uh, epidemic and the whole bit at that time period and um, it, it's sort of like the characters in it are fictitious uh, th or fictional but um, he uh, it does that I think just so he doesn't have any lawsuits by naming real names but he's given them names in such a way and put them in situations that you basically have an idea who he's referring to and um, it's a very comprehensive book and what I mean by that is uh, in my electronic reader, it's well over 3,000 pages. It takes a while. And it's it's not a hard read, but it is a it can be a bit of a difficult read because of the fact that he does make up these names and things, and there's a lot of them. And he has, like, in, uh, short forms for institutions that really don't exist, but they do exist because, again, they are parallel to what really was there in the time or still is, and it's a really an eye-opener about the whole uh, process that basically governments and companies go through when it comes down to an epidemic. Now, of course, it's focused on the AIDS uh, epidemic, uh, but a lot of the things that are discussed in the book actually uh, parallel what's going on right now, right now with the coronavirus, which is kind of scary, but of course... As an English teacher, I do know that oftentimes literature reflects reality or predicts reality, uncannily so. So it is kind of a, an interesting read. I don't know if it's... I, I started reading this before we got into this whole virus thing. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing to read while this is going on. I mean, there's a show on Netflix, I see. I haven't watched it. It's called Pandemic. I don't know if that's something we should be watching right now. Um, I think we should be watching a lot of comedies, really. A lot of what I call amusing time wasters. Um, um, good question, Laura. He may have. And uh, I have, I've not, I've never read the book, but I did see the, you know, the movie version of the play. Um, in fact, it's one of my favorite uh, movies, uh, only because I don't know if, if you're not somebody uh, directly involved in the LGBTQ community, I, I think there's some things you would miss in it, but it's still worth the watch. It's an old movie. I think it was made in the I don't know, tail end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Um, I remember first seeing it in the early 80s. And, um, yeah, it was a real eye-opener, that movie, on so many levels. And because of where I was in my life at that point in time, too. So it's worth the watch. Um... Shelly says, Stephen and all you lovelies, just going off for my morphine and oxygen. 
Okay, that sounds cheery, Shelley. Thank you so much for making me feel welcome. I've made friends today because of you, Stephen. Thank you. Hope I'm welcome back. You are always welcome back, Shelley. We're glad to have you. So have take care. Hope everything goes good with your day. Wiki says the band played on politics, people in the AIDS epidemic is 90 cent by San Francisco Chronicle journalist. Oh, Randy Schlitz. Oh, okay. Oh, the normal heart. Yeah, that's a little bit more. Uh, yeah, actually, I think you're right, uh, Laura. It, it it is the norm. The normal heart. I saw that. Uh, I think it was on Netflix too, and that's that's a good one too. But I think that one came under a lot of criticism because they seem to think that they um, kind of glossed over the the situation in its reality. Um, the sort of uh, what's what's the term? Um, sanitized it a little bit. I think I heard criticism about that, but I liked it. I thought that was pretty good as well. Actually, what I was thinking of when you said the band uh, played on was another one called The Boys in the Band. That's the one that was made probably the late 70s, maybe the very early 80s. And it's actually, it doesn't, yeah, I think it does talk about AIDS, but from a very from the very beginning stages of it, and that's not what it's all about. Uh, it's actually a movie that's got a lot of really bitchy characters in it. Uh, some stereotypes about gay men in there too, but it's all done, and I think it was a play at one time, and they made a movie of it. It's worth a watch as well, but it is definitely a time period piece. Well, I got uh, these all done. One of them looks like I've got a little mark on it. I'm not happy about that. Um, so what do I do with these now that I have them all squared up? And believe me, it doesn't usually take me that long to square up stuff for this. By now I would have had the block made, but that's okay. I'm not on any kind of time scale. I suppose my coffee has gone cold. Um, so, I have to look at this. So, I need to... I am making this small block right down here at the moment. And that means I need four of these. And I need one of these squares. Put these to the side. And I need one of these little squares. To make this particular block so or corner actually of the block so let's see I'll lay these out make sure I get the points going the right way blue goes that way that way one goes down this way this way and then one of these goes up in the corner. There we go. Okay, so I'll probably dump these all on the floor trying to show you what this looks like, but I'll hold it up. So that's what I have to sew together. So to do this, I need to sew it in rows. So it means, in this case, I will sew this row, and then I will sew these two pieces together. No, will I do it that way? These two have to go on here, but these need to be joined together first. Yeah, so I'll sew that one first, I'll sew these two next, then these two will be sewn to this piece, and then this piece will be sewn to this top piece. Yeah, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yep, purple and blue, two of my favorite colors. Now I know some people have an aversion to purple. I don't, I like purple. And a lot of my quilts do have that um, color combination in them. Because I like them. Oh, you like it too. Okay, Laura. Good. Oh, B does as well. So that's good. All right, so what I have to do here is I have to lay right sides together and so along here. Now, I'm going to change my foot. This is the foot I was using. This foot is the one that has the edge that I follow. But 
I could use this one on here as well because I need a quarter inch seam allowance and that's marked for it. But I like to use this one because it's got a little guide that you just rest right against the fabric and away you go and you get your quarter inch seam. There are many different ways of doing this, but this is the way that I like. And so I line these up. And make sure I'm set up here for a quarter inch. Yes, I am. Just raise my foot, put it down, and away we go. Cut that. So now I have those two pieces together. And yeah, it's the right size. They're the right size. I'm okay. And now I'm just finger pressing that seam over and out of my way and I'm going to put this next piece on the end of that making sure I've got it going the right direction line it up line it up okay and stitch it down oh, I keep reaching under here for my lifter I don't need to this is automatic this is the problem when you have two sewing machines if you go back and forth between them you get mixed up on which one has which controls Okay, so I have that piece together for the top. Now I'm going to put these two side pieces together and make sure I sew them on the proper side because it's very easy <laughs> to get things mixed up and then you have to do some unsewing. We don't call it ripping out in quilt making. Look at that, I'm still reaching under there. It's called unsewing. I guess it makes it sound like it was intentional even though it was a mistake. Okay, so I've got these two pieces that are going to go on this side. Now I need to press that seam. Again, pressing it to the dark side. And I'm putting it on this big square. Okay. Okay. So I've got those two. Oops. What did I do here? Ah. Yeah, I got to do some unsewing, people. I somehow I got this little corner underneath tipped under. That happens sometimes and I wasn't being careful and I need to be careful. Okay. I'm trying to do this with these little scissors instead of my seam ripper because it means I have to get up and get my seam ripper. Okay, I've got to get up and get my seam ripper. Oh, no I don't. I've got it right here. I forgot I moved all my tools in behind me. And this cute little thing I made this is on one of those acrylic picture frames that you can buy at the dollar store. I learned how to make this at a retreat I went to. Little pockets for all your tools and it just sits up here like that. It's really cool. I like it. Okay, my trusty seam ripper is out. Don't leave home without it. Okay, these stitches are very small. Okay, I'm just gonna give that a light press. There we go. Now let's see if we can do this the right way this time. Yeah, well it would help too if I stitch this on the right side too. Okay, that should have fixed that problem. And it did. So that to or let's press that to the dark side. Okay, so now we're going to put this top piece. This is where I'm at right at the moment. Okay, so that top piece has to be sewn there, but I need to press it. And since I pressed the seam towards that way, I've got to press the seam in the opposite direction because what you're, I'm going to do is I'm going to match up the seams on this block, and so they'll lock together if 
when you press it, if one seam is going that way and the seam below it is going that way, then they sort of lock together. And that's a good thing because then it doesn't cut off your points or anything else like that. And I like to give it a little bit of a wonder clip here. These are the best invention in sewing, these little wonder clips. I don't know if you can see it. Instead of pins, I hate using pins, mainly because I draw blood, mine, when I use them, because I'm a klutz. These work in place of pins for most things. Now, there are some times when you have to use pins, but this is one time when I can use the wonder clips, and they're great. And I just put a couple on here, and this keeps things in the right spot as I start to sew, so, so, so so that uh, I don't end up with uh, mismatched seams. Okay. This will be a little test here to see how accurate I am being. And now when you get to the clip, you can just pull it out. thread cutter did not thread cut. That happens every now and then. Okay. Yes, that is good. And so let's just press that seam. Okay. There we go. There's the first little section of this big block. Okay. Taking me a lot longer than usual, but again, I said that's okay. Okay, oh, Chris says, Steven, 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 Steven. Steven, see, you have to do a tool caddy video. Sorry about that. I could not help myself. <laughs> I don't know if I remember how to make it. <laughs> I don't know if I can find the instructions anymore for it. You're not the first person that's asked me about that, but I'll, I will keep that as a note, and maybe I will do. I'll look for it and see if I can figure it out again and make it. Uh, it would be great, too, for crafting tools, not just sewing tools. Um... Oh, everybody wants the tool caddy. Okay, I didn't know it was going to be that popular. Um, okay, well, I will think upon that, people. Not making any promises, but yeah, okay. If I can find the pattern, uh, I'll possibly do it. Um, yeah, so now on this block, the next thing is I have to join these two pieces, actually three pieces two rectangular pieces in the purple and then another one of these little blocks here. So I got to find those. And let's see. Um, here's one little square. I've got that handy. And then I need these two purple rectangle pieces. And I think these are are they? No, nope. these are two inch squares. Just give me a second. I'm going out of camera shop for just a minute. I wrote notes on my little bags that have all my pre-cut pieces in them. And they're kind of cryptic. Two inch squares, block corners in brackets, two by five rectangles, 64 of them. Okay. These are the two by five inch strip pieces. There's one. Here's another. Now I'm using fabric that is in a gradient color, so things are not solids. And this will make my quilt look sort of what they call scrappy. And that's okay. I like the scrappy look. Um, okay, I just need to press that, these two a little bit, because they got a little wrinkly in the bag. Okay, so I'll show you what I'm doing now. I've got that piece I just finished, and then there's two long rectangular pieces and another corner block that go together like that. So I need to sew that one to that one, this one to this one, and then this whole piece to that. 
and that will finish this part of the square. So you see I'm kind of building out. Uh, here it is. So this piece right here, these are the pieces I'm talking about, are going to fill that in. And then we work on the bigger part. And then that does a quarter of the block. Yeah, it is a bit involved. Okay, what are people saying? Okay, Chris, um, thanks for joining me today. Um, oh yeah, I guess so. <laughs> 1 a.m. there. Yeah, you probably do need to sleep. And that's great. So we'll see you again, Chris, soon. Oh, okay, Kathy, and thank you for coming, Pat Kathy. I just noticed that you're here. Um, Laura says, Steve, I need a suggestion for a sewing machine, more for crafting small projects and for journal making on the cheap. Um, go to go to Costco, uh, online Costco, and look for a brother machine. That was my very first sewing machine was a brother. And I bought it at Costco. It was $189. It came with 50 decorative stitches, and it came with what they call an extended table. This is an extended table. It wouldn't be this big at that price. Um, now, the one thing was, I bought that machine for what you want to do with it. I bought it for crafting. Um, I had some problems with it, mainly because I didn't know what I was doing, um, but not to the point where I couldn't use it. I sort of busted my automatic uh, threader that was on it, and the automatic threader on it is more manual. It's a pull-down lever on that particular model, but you can get them for, you know, under $200. Uh, especially if you're going to do crafting with them, you don't need a hugely computerized machine or whatever uh, for that kind of thing. Um, I would stay away from, now I don't know if you've seen it Laura because I know you follow Mike Deacon's videos, but Mike Deacon uh, on some recent videos was showing a sewing machine that he would bought for his mother that she never used. Well, it was a really cheap machine. Really cheap. And he's using it to sew together his journals and things. Um, I wouldn't recommend going for that kind of machine, mainly because I think you'll have more problems with it than it's worth. Uh, I'm not sure what that machine probably cost him, but I would say that that machine probably cost around 100 bucks, our money, or something like that. Don't recommend it. Um, I think if you spend a couple of hundred, you'd be okay for crafting. And the thing is, as you use it more and more, you may want something more elaborate. Um, you're not going to get a machine that cheap at, like, the quilting store here in our town. Laura lives in the same town as me. Um, you'd have to go and look, you know, at some place like, I don't even know what Walmart you would get one that cheap. You'd have to go online. Look at Amazon or look at Costco online. Um, you might even go into the Costco store. They might have some. Um, I bought that first one I was talking about right from the store. I didn't order it online. But I'm not sure, and given right now our situation with this, you might be more comfortable ordering something like that online. Um, but that would be my recommendation. When you start getting into this kind of line of stuff, which I can very much use for crafting as well, and I did. In fact, I've been making some junk journals, because in my next art journaling class, we're doing junk journals, and I'm bringing this little sewing machine with me to you know, sew the uh, covers and the and the binding in it, but um, or the the signatures into it, into the binding. However, that was an eleven hundred dollar machine. Okay, so I'm sure you don't want to spend that kind of money for it. I mean, I didn't buy it for crafting; I bought it for sewing. Simple as that. So that's my recommendation. I hope that helps you. Yeah, I mean, brothers make a half-decent machine. Um, I wouldn't buy one now, uh, not with the level that I'm working at. But if you are not, if you're an occasional sewer, if you want to use it for crafting, I would go probably towards brother. Problem with brother here in Canada, though, is getting them serviced, and which is ironic because brother has a headquarters in Quebec. But apparently it's not easy to get them serviced um, by an authorized brother dealer and also finding an authorized brother dealer. That's not an online kind of thing or like Costco uh, for them. So, you know, I, I 
that's all I know about Brother Machines. I know nothing more about it. So that's it. My only experience was with that cheapo that I bought at Costco. Oh, yeah, this machine, <laughs> I do have taken it to classes, but that's why I bought the smaller machine. This machine weighs 38 pounds. Before you put this big unit sitting on the front of it, this comes off. This is the embroidery unit, and that adds another six, seven pounds to this sucker. So, yeah, this this is not really meant to be a portable machine, although I do lug it to embroidery classes if I'm taking an embroidery class. And I did lug it with me to the retreat that I went on a couple of weeks ago, along with the smaller one. But that's why I got the smaller one, for that reason. Um, so, but I do love it. It is my baby. I do love this machine. Some people name their machines. I don't. It's my machine. It's my 15,000. That's what I call it. That's what it is. Some call them, like, weird names, for some reason. Okay, so I'm going to, to sew this piece onto this piece. Actually, by doing this live today and doing some sewing, I actually think I could conduct a tutorial on a, on a simple project. I've been, I have been asked by various individuals if I would do that, and I've always said, well, I'm not really comfortable with that idea right now. Um, but I think I could. I think I probably could. The reason I'm not that comfortable with it is because I'm not an expert. Yeah, I, I know that it kind of looks like I know what I'm doing, and I do, but there's always more to learn. And um, I'm the kind of person that wants to make sure that I know exactly what I'm doing, and I want to keep it really organized and things like that, because I don't want to confuse anybody. Of course, that's my teacher training in me, right? Um, but now you've given me an idea about that caddy. I just might do a tutorial about that. I will see. Um, no promises. First of all, i got to find the bloody pattern for it. I think I know where it might be. Um, and then I have to make sure I have materials for it. It is not a difficult thing to do. and um, I think even someone who's pretty much a non-sewer could probably make one of these. And as I said, it's not just for sewing. You could use it for some of your smaller craft tools. You know, your pens, your pencils, a uh, pair of scissors, um, you know, paper piercer, whatever. Okay, let's get this pressed properly. And now we're going to put this piece on. And again, I need to line up my seams. And I did not press this one correctly for that because I need to have the seams interlock, so I'm just going to press it the other way. I didn't used to worry about which direction my seams were going when they're pressed. I just let them go wherever they want to go. And I found out, yeah, that's not really the way to do it. Um, there is method to the madness with people who kept talking about which way to press your seams. It does make a difference. It helps you really to line them up. My iron right now smells very April fresh after using that uh, cling, uh, bounce sheet on it, or cling free sheet or whatever they're called, dryer sheet. this has worked out here. Give it a press. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So that's the stage we're at right now. Okay, so now we need to do the larger sections. And now I have to review my notes to see what do I need. So in this part, this is the part I'm talking about now that goes on top of that. And I basically need one, two, three, four half square triangles, the larger ones, and one big square here. So that means I need to make some of those. 
And according to my notes, I need two four inch squares and two four inch squares of background. Okay, my note's a little cryptic. So where are my four inch squares? Okay, I need... So these are the four inch squares we're talking about. You have background. Let's put that down there in front. So I need four of these, and I'm just lining up what's the right side and what's the wrong side. And it's hard to tell on this fabric because of the way the pattern is designed. Okay. squares. Okay, that's three inch squares. All right, where are my four inch squares? Maybe these are that. Nope, those are three and a half inch. Okay, just give me a second, people. I'm going out of shot. Ha, ah, I found it. This is what I need, right here. Four inch squares, okay. And I need how many of those? Four? No, I only need two. Oh, okay, so I need two of those, so I only need it, two of these white ones too, as well. Okay, fine. Put those back in here. Okay, this is interesting. I have two piles. All right. Well, probably my clip wasn't big enough. I am talking to myself now. Okay. How many people have I lost? Okay. Kat says, hey, an idea for SW Live sometime. I would love to hear more about junk journaling and what it is. I've watched YouTubes, but really don't get how it is different from art journaling. Oh, okay. Well, that's an interesting thing. Um, maybe we'll talk about that this uh, weekend, Kathy. When we do on Sunday, we're doing an art attack, and we're going to work on some tags, fun with tags. Um, so if you remind me, uh, if you're going to be on on Sunday, I will show you. Uh, actually, I showed in my vlog yesterday the junk journal that uh, I just made. But yeah, we can discuss that then. Um, that would be good. Okay, so just remind me uh, of that. Um, you can make caddies for the elderly, hold your glass, pens, etc. Hmm, that's an interesting idea too. I think I'd have to change the design slightly, but that could be done. Yeah. Yeah, true, um, Roy. Um, yeah, I watch yours all the time. You've got some really interesting bags. I have to say, you're very creative with that. And if nobody knows what I'm talking about, Bootsy Sweet Tarts here. Actually, I met Bootsy in person at a place in Florida about a year ago, was it, Roy? I think about a year ago, this past February or something. Uh, we were both staying in the same place and got talking. And uh, so I always watch uh, his videos. And he's a very crafty person. Um, does some really interesting stuff. And I have to say, Roy, your videos, since I started watching them, have gotten uh, technical, technically a lot better. In fact, you do stuff that I don't do yet. You, your picture in the picture. I guess you're using OBS. I know what OBS is. I can't use it on my computer because for some reason, my computer, it kicks out the video card when I use it. And so I don't use that uh, program. Um, I'm probably at the state now where I need a new main computer. I mean, I don't have any lack of computers in my house, okay? Between our iPads 
and we have several of those. And our ITV, our our Apple TVs and our computers. I mean, my craft room has three computers in it right now. As I speak, this room has a computer in it up over here as well, which is a newer computer. But my main computer I've had now for hmm, probably over 10 years. It's been a good computer. I spent a lot of money on that. And I probably was probably getting to the time now where I should buy a new one, invest in a new one. But what holds me back is not so much the money as in do I go PC again or should I move into the world of Mac? There's a lot to be said for Macs when it comes to making videos and things like that. Um, I mean, I like making videos on my iPad and my iPhone simply because the software that they come with is so easy to manipulate and does a really great job of it. Whereas with the PC, it's a little bit more cumbersome, I find. And it may be part of my lack of knowledge with that. I don't know. But a Mac, when I've been a PC user all my life, you know, well, in the life of when we started with computers, um, I hesitate. So I don't know, but maybe. Yeah, see, my, my big one was in its day was a gaming computer as well. And I bought it for the same reason, because it has better memory, faster processor speeds, better video cards in it. But like I said, I've had it for over 10 years. It's now like dated uh, with it. Things have gotten better since then. Okay, so I've got to make some more half square triangles here. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did last time. I'm just going to take my pencil and my ruler and draw a diagonal line on the wrong side of these two four inch squares diagonal line from corner to corner point to point so there we have that that's what it looks like don't know if you can see the lines but they're there trust me and now i'm using batik in this a lot and batiks sometimes do not have a right or a wrong side or sometimes they have a more of a right side than a wrong side but these two look pretty good which makes working with batiks sometimes easier because you don't have to be aware of it doesn't matter what side you do your stuff on but sometimes that's not always true with batiks i love batiks um they just go with everything and they have such great patterns and colors and the whole bit um the process is quite interesting too to watch how they make batiks the dyeing process you can find videos on youtube about it um, I really can't explain it myself. Got to change my foot um, because it is a fairly involved process, but it's interesting to see how they do it. Okay, so I'm putting on my quarter inch foot again for this. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to sew down on either side of that line to create my half square triangles. And I will chain piece this. Just pop up my next one. It's actually batik, B A T I K. And yes, it is a particular kind of fabric. Well, it's cotton. But it's the process where they color it. it it's dyed. It's usually dyed by hand. Um, and it comes from like India, uh, Indonesia, that kind of thing. It's a whole process. It involves wax and dyes and things. Um, and the patterns that are on them are all like there's less control over the pattern print. So you never know exactly what you're going to get. Um, so working with them, that makes them really kind of interesting to work with because you don't have to match things up as carefully as you do when you're picking regular printed cotton fabrics. Uh, they're very, very popular. Most quilt stores will carry a, uh, a good selection of batiks. Um, they tend to be a little bit stiffer than regular cotton, it may be because of the dye uh, that's in them, the process it goes through. So that makes them really nice to work with as well. 
I really like batiks, and I often have a lot of batiks in many of my quilts uh, with it too. So I've got that sewn together, so now I can take these and do what I did the last time, and that is cut them in half along that line. Find my ruler. Now, if you're not familiar with quilting rulers, they are different from regular rulers. They are acrylic, they are see-through, they're marked with various uh, lines and that for helping you to cut in certain sizes. And they also usually have on the back of them um, a rough surface so they don't slide when you're cutting your fabric. And that's very important because if you ever cut yourself with a rotary cutter, you will know. And I have. And it's not fun because these suckers are razor sharp. You'll notice I keep letting it close because there's nothing worse than have, leaving it open. You can lock this open and you reach down and grab it. That way you won't have any fingers left. So believe me, you only need to cut yourself once with a rotary cutter and you'll never try and do that again. And it could be a very serious cut. I can tell you that. So there are some precautions you have to take as a quilter. It's, there are some dangers in there. Okay, let us iron these to the dark side and just a tip about uh, when you iron you do not I call it ironing it's more pressing you you don't iron like you'd iron a shirt you basically press down on the seam otherwise you could stretch your fabric and uh, you're gonna say well how can you stretch fabric well you can if it's cut on the bias on the bias means it's against the grain and that's where the stretch comes in your fabric. And this is cut on a bias when you have triangles, okay? So the first thing you want to do is set your seam, they call it, and that's just applying some heat to the seam you just sewed, and that actually make, loosens up your stitches a little bit so that when you flip it open like I'm doing here and ironing it over to the dark side, uh, you'll get a, a nice even fold right along that stitch line. Uh, if you don't have that, then you're going to have problems getting things square. There's a lot of mathematics involved in quilting, I have found. And um, I'm a little bit geometrically challenged, which means that I had a lot of trouble with geometry, and there's a lot of geometry in quilt making when I was in school. So that's why sometimes, that's where I make my most mistakes, is I get things turned upside down or backwards. And of course, then there's the mathematics involved in figuring out, especially if you don't have a pattern, you're making your own thing up, um, of figuring out what size squares have to be. Because they will tell you in a pattern um, that, uh, you know, uh, finished and unfinished. Because when you go to sew these things into a quilt, you will lose a quarter of an inch on possibly all sides or on one side or two sides, depending on where it goes in the quilt. So that affects the whole overall dimensions of everything as well. Um, yes, Roy, I am using that, uh, the Rowena travel iron, and I love it. This is not my main iron. This is the one I take with me to classes. But I can tell you, I have an Alisio. An Alisio, my main iron, and it's the one that pops up when you put it down. You don't set it up on its end like I'm doing with this one. You basically set it right down flat to the surface and it pops up so it doesn't scorch anything and I bought that iron mainly for that feature uh, it was an expensive iron it cost me about 250 bucks for it and I don't like it um, the reason I don't like it is first of all this is my second one because the company replaced my first one it, it didn't pop anymore it didn't do anything anymore it just stopped and it was actually out of warranty by one month but they were really good their customer service with that company is excellent they immediately sent me a brand new one and they sent me information and everything for how to ship the old one back to them it didn't cost me anything to ship it back to them it was really easy it went through ups um so that was great but i don't like its steam feature on it it just doesn't seem to steam as well this one you get a lot of steam out of this sucker take a look at that i don't get that out of the elysio um, one problem with that one, though, is it's got a small water tank on it, so it only holds about two ounces of water, so you run out very quickly. Um, so when my Olysio dies, or sooner, 
I want to invest in a large professional style tank iron by Rowenta, which basically is a big tank of water and you don't have to keep refilling it every 10 minutes or so. Or so. Um, they're expensive. You can get them on Amazon and other places and I think they run around 350 Canadian dollars or whatnot. But that's what I want next with that. So, but I do love that little one. And that's why I want another Rowenta, but I want the big professional tank style. Yes, it is small and uses less electricity. Um, maybe I don't sound very ecologically minded when I say this, but I don't care about how much electricity it uses. I just like what I already said about it. Um, so, let us... Now, what do we have to do with these next? These squares. So, looking at my one. So, I need one of those 4-inch. Okay, why have I written down there too? Okay, that was those ones. But I need this one up in the corner. Okay, so what size is this one? Up in the corner. Here we go. We got to do the math. Should have wrote that down. Okay, that's coming up to three and a quarter, which means it was three and a half, probably. Yeah, so that's basically a, th a three and a half inch square. So. I believe this is a three and a half inch square. So it's the same as that one down in here. Yeah. Okay. Got that figured out. So that. And that's going. Make sure I have these all the. Oops, that's the wrong way. That one has to go that way. That one has to go this way. Uh, this one has to go this way. And this one goes, oh, I hear Walter's up, so I may be ending this shortly. And then this one, okay, how do I get an extra one here? Oh, no, no, that goes over there. And that one goes down in there. Okay, I think I have this figured out. Double check. Yep. Okay, so here we go. Get that out of our way. And... I should lay this out over here so I can see it better because I'm running out of space. Oh, I didn't square these up though. Okay, got to square those blocks up. And they have to be squared up so they are 4 inch squares. So I need a 4 inch square ruler for this. This is the ruler that I need, and let's see here. Same thing as I did with the smaller ones. I'm laying my ruler down here so that I know I can get, wait, maybe these aren't four inch. These are more three and a half inch. Where's my sample? Small ruler. Uh, it would help if I read the instructions. Yeah, these are squared up to three and a half inches, not four. That makes more sense. Do I have it? Yeah, I do have a three and a half inch ruler. Good. Should have. I have a thousand rulers. It's the bane of your existence as a quilter. You buy rulers for everything, and you usually have repeats, and you only you don't need that many. But that's the first thing a quilter when you first get into quilting you do you're mesmerized by all the different tools and the rulers are part of that and you tend to buy a lot of them okay I'm at three and a half inches so let's chop it chop it so 
spin that around 180 degrees. Actually, I should be using the rotation feature of this mat for this instead of doing what I'm doing here. Yeah, that's bright. I told you all about that, uh, how great it is to have this kind of rotating mat. And then I don't use that feature. Yeah, bright move. Okay, that's one done. Sorry if you're seeing my belly button. And the next one. It's difficult to cut sitting down, I find. I need to stand up. Okay, let's just swivel this around. See, that's how this mat's supposed to work. Makes life easier if you use your tools the way they're intended. So, am I missing out anything here? All the pretties? All the pretties? I'm not sure what you mean by that. You mean pretty as in pretty, pretty, or purples? Oh, I hear Walter in the shower. I don't know if you can hear that right now. I'm in the part of the basement that has some of the pipes in it, so. That's him having a shower. What time is it? Oh my goodness, it's 20 to 12. Wow, I don't think I've ever done a video this long. I've definitely never did a have done a live one this long. So I thank you for sharing your time with me. Um, it's been fun for me. I don't know if it's been fun for you, really, but uh, you know, it's very social. It's like you're all here with me. Well, you are virtually, and that's kind of nice. I didn't know how this was going to work today, and. Uh, so I was taking a chance. It was a bit of an experiment. And I really thank you for, for joining me. Um, I'll maybe do another one. Maybe one day later this week or something. Um, I need to do some more stuff on my grimoire. That, for those of you that watch my blog on a regular basis, you know what I'm talking about. So I might do another impromptu little live uh, from my craft table. And... Uh, work on the next part of my grimoire with you. We'll see about that. That might be fun. And so for those of you that, you know, not so much into the quilting sewing business, but more into the crafting, that'll be for you. Okay, let's clean up these pieces. And let's sew these, lay them out again, and get them in the right configuration. And then I can show you what one quarter of the block, which took two hours to make, is going to look like. Okay, so I need to put those two together this way. That out of my way, that out of my way. Oh, now I've got things mixed up here. Okay, let's sew that together. Well, I'm glad that uh, you did enjoy it, Virginia. As I said, I've been enjoying this myself as well, because usually <laughs> I'm sitting in here and I'm talking to myself. Okay, so at least I know I'm not completely crazy. There were actually people here that I was talking to. And as I said, it was nice to see that you were all like talking to each other as well. And I was very happy to be able to f facilitate that. Uh, for you. Okay. This piece is going this way. You know, making a quilt is like putting together sometimes a jigsaw puzzle. I was never good at those jigsaw puzzles. And I don't know what it is about quilt making that really appeals to me. Um, because 
I never ever had any desire before now to sew. Um, and I got into this because I inadvertently bought a sewing machine for crafting, like I was talking about a little bit earlier, the one that I bought at Costco. And I, at the same time, I bought a Cricut maker. I already had several other Cricuts over the years. And, you know, Cricut's the die-cutting machine. A Cricut maker is their pretty much their best machine. And the reason I bought it uh, was because it had a rotary cutter. A little mini rotary cutter built into it so you could cut fabric. And I thought, well, that might be interesting for crafting. And with that and the combination of the little sewing machine I bought, um, I, oh, okay, haha, <laughs> see, I did it. No, it didn't, did I? Yeah, I did. I screwed up. Okay, that's not supposed to look like that. There's my trusty little, I'm going to do some unsewing here. Um, Yeah, I bought, they had a pattern that came with the Cricut Maker. Well, actually on their on their website that they have um, that goes along with their Cricut machines for making a simple wall hanging um, using the rotary cutter in the machine. And I had a sewing machine, so I thought, I will give this a try. That's what hooked me into quilting. Um, up to that point in time, I had not had a lot of exposure to quilting. Now my grandmother quilted, um, but I was never around her when she was doing the quilting. I have some of her quilts here uh, from over the years. Uh, so I never really saw the process of quilting firsthand. Um, I did know that they took a lot of time, a lot of patience, and I didn't have a lot of either <laughs> of those. At least I didn't think I did. So I um, decided to make this wall hanging and fell in love with the whole idea. And at the same time, some of the parts of my brother fell off. So I started to explore quilting stores. I didn't even know there were quilting stores in my area. Never been in them before, but I'd never explored basically sewing. I knew of a place called Fabric Land, which we now refer to as the F store for many reasons. Um, Fabric Land's sort of the Michaels of sewing. Everything's expensive and everything, and a lot of their products are not the best quality, but you're paying like more than top dollar for them. They have coupons too, so that's what I mean. I wouldn't be surprised if Michaels and Fabric Land were owned by the same corporation. But, um, now let's try and get this right here. Stop talking for a second. These have to go this way, no, this way, this way I meant, I'm geometrically challenged, this way. So that goes down here, and that's the edge I'm going to sew. Okay. So anyways, I start to explore these stores, which only one of them now exists. And that's only been in, you know, the last couple of years. Okay, I only started this about two years ago. Um, so I was in one store, and I saw this fabric I really liked, and I saw a quilt that it had been made from, and now I know it was called K Facet Fabrics, who's a major manu major designer of really funky, colorful fabrics, and I've used them in a lot of my quilts. Am I right now? Yeah, I'm right now. Um, and I saw this kit for about, mm, I think it was about 70 bucks. And I said to the lady that owned the store, I knew she gave a class, but I wasn't really up for going for a class. So I said, uh, you know, could, um, you know, someone like me, I, I, if I read the instructions and that, could I do this on my own? And she goes, oh yeah, you could. So I bought the kit. And I sat down with the book that it came with, and it was a, basically a sampler quilt, my very first quilt, and it taught me all the more traditional types of squares and things that are in most quilts, and uh, away I went. And that's when my brother gave out on me on a couple of its devices. There was something called a walking foot, which I had no idea what that was at the time, and I busted it because that wasn't so much brother's problem as my problem, because it was operator error. And uh, I phoned up the quilting store I go to all the time now and said to them, you know, I needed this part. Did they have it? And they said, well, yeah, but bring in your machine because, we, you know, they're different for different machines. So I brought in my machine, 
or no, I was going to bring in my machine, then my thread, a threader on it died. Oh, look, my thread broke. This happens. Oh, no, come up. Okay, ooh, got a bird's nest on the back. So something went terribly wrong here. Well, not terribly, just an annoyance. Let's cut off that. So I went into this door and uh, I, at that point, and she says, oh, you're the guy who called about um, buying a walking foot for a brother's sewing machine. And I said, yeah, I don't want one of those now. Uh, I want you to sell me a sewing machine. Whoa, her eyes lit up and she says, I certainly can do that. She says, and what's your budget? And I said, because I had done some research before I went. And when I said I had done some research, I mean Walter had done some research. And I figured I could get a pretty much decent sewing machine for about $3,000. And so that's what I said to her. I said I was go as high as $3,000. Her eyes lit up again and goes, we have many to choose from in that price range. And so she proceeded to show me these machines. And why am I having a problem here? Because I'm yapping and I'm not concentrating on what I'm doing. Come on. There we There we go. Get the thing threaded. Um And so she did. She showed me several machines and I settled on what now is known as the Janome 6700. P, which is the machine that Walter now uses because I gave it to him when I got my dream machine right here and uh, it's a good machine it's been working fine and I went ahead and did the sampler quilt and I was really pleased with it still one of my better quilts which is amazing because when I went to my second quilt with that I made all kinds of mistakes so beginner's luck I don't know one or the other let's get this sewn on and that's how I became a quilter then I started to immerse myself in all things quilting. So I started to buy books. I started to watch YouTube videos. Um, and it just went from there. And I haven't looked back. The only thing I do regret is that I don't spend as much time because I don't have as much interest in my traditional crafting. Um, and that makes me sad because I have a lot of stuff <laughs> that's involved with it. But, you know, you do whatever you love. And your tastes change over time. Geez, I've got a lot of threads on here that I don't need. So, that's how I became basically a quilter. Then, Walter came home one day and he said there was a woman uh, that he knew uh, that was a member of the local Quilters Guild. Again, I didn't know there was such things as Quilters Guilds. And so I went to a couple of their meetings and now I'm the secretary of that guild. And uh, it's, there's about 130 four ladies and me. I'm the only man in the guild. There was another man when I first joined up, but he was coming with his mother all the time. I'm sure there's a story in that, if you think about it. Um, but he's not coming anymore because he got a new job and it's just not, it doesn't work for him in the timing of the whole thing. So I'm the only guy and I'm now the secretary of the guild as well. And I'm in the process of training women how not to be sexist. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? Yeah. Well, they're not really sexist. Um, but, you know, they kind of looked at a man coming in as being a bit of an invasion of their territory. And um, I get it. But since then, I have discovered there are all kinds of male quilters out there. Um, in fact, another one that's online you might be familiar with through the crafting videos is uh, Ian, the off-kilter crafter. He's also a quilter, and I believe he's president of his guild, and he belongs to a modern quilt guild. And modern quilting is something I want to get a little bit more into. They're, those quilts are really art quilts. They don't follow the traditional patterns and do a lot of things with negative space, and really quite interesting. Okay, so let us see what we have. I think I may have this block, or this part of the big block, now done. We just need to press it open properly yeah my points are looking good they've lined up and I think I got everything going the right way where's my sample yes I have so two hours later I have that <laughs> which is only one quarter of the larger one but there you go that's what I've been putting together as we've been talking and 
Well, I'm glad you are, uh, Aunt B. And I'm glad, Laura, you had a lot of fun with it, too. <laughs> Cindy, you nasty. Quick, shut the hot water off. You know what he hates? Inadvertently, when he gets into a shower, I usually have to go to the bathroom. So then I flush the toilet and he gets scalded. And he says I do that on purpose. I don't. I don't think. Maybe it's subconscious. But whatever. Um, yeah, I like the landscape quilts, too. I look like painted landscapes. Yeah, they're cool. And they are basically an art quilt. So, anyways, people... With him up and out of the shower, I hear him now. It means it's coming to lunchtime. So I think um, that's enough of me for one day. You've got an awful lot of me. But I have enjoyed this time together. And I will do something again maybe later this week. And I think I'll do that one, as I said, as a, a craft one. Um, and yeah, this has been fun. So thanks so much for joining me today. And we'll see you again real soon. And probably later in the week, but also don't forget on Sunday, Stephen and Walter live as usual at 4 p.m. Um, and we're doing Art Attack on that, and then my weekly vlogs, which come out on Mondays. So we'll see you all then. Thanks again for joining me, and have a great day, and keep safe and healthy. Bye for now.